Chapter 19 The secret camp was in shadows beneath a tangled canopy of trees. There were two pup tents and a fire pit. Pegged to the ground was a faded green tarp covering a chest-high stack of supplies. A flap opened on one of the tents and a gangly figure crawled out. It was Mrs. Starch. She rose slowly, brushing herself off, her eyes blazing at the sight of Nick and Marta. What's the meaning of this, she demanded. They carjacked me, Twilly said. Sort of. Mrs. Starch scowled. Oh, please. Despite the chilly reception, Nick was relieved to see his biology teacher, biology teacher unharmed and still as ornery as ever, except for the straw hat. She had on the same clothes the day of the field trip. Baggy, long sleeve shirt, canopy, canvas pants, and wading boots. Still, Mrs. Starch looked different, older, and more tired. Her heavy makeup had worn off, and her stripe of strip of coffee brown roots bisected her mass of tinted blonde hair, which was tied in a ragged ponytail. There was no sign of her huge dragonfly sunglasses. It's your turn to entertain them. I'm heading out on a poop patrol, Twilly told her, and sauntered back into the woods. Nick assumed he was taking a he was taking a bathroom break. Mrs. Starch began pacing as she did in class. It had the same nerve-wracking effect on Marta as it always did. She turned greenish and queasy. Nick set the pizza boxes on a tree stump. Where, what do you have to say for yourselves, Mrs. Starch said. Marta was in no condition to speak, and Nick had not yet composed a presentation. The best he could muster up was, we were worried. Worried or just plain nosy, Mrs. Starch shot back. It's rude enough that you broke into my home, and now this? Nick thought he had heard a faint ruffling noise. Mrs. Starch, uh, but he couldn't tell where it came from. Still clutching her phone, Marta sat down on the log near a fire pit and took a deep breath to ward off the nausea. The wind picked up from the north, putting a cool bite into the air. Mrs. Starch's footsteps crunched on crisp twigs and leaves as she stalked back and forth in front of them. She seemed not quite as tall as Nick remembered. You have no right to be here. No right, she said. Marta raised a limp hand. It was all Nick's idea. Undoubtedly, said Mrs. Starch. We just want to know what's going on, Nick heard himself say. Get more specific. Okay, the fire? Tell us about the fire. Ah, said Mrs. Starch. And smoke. I mean, Dwayne Jr. The teacher stopped pacing and planted her knuckles on her hips. Anything else? Yes, Nick said. He has so many questions. Marta peeped. Your house. All those stuffed animals. Mrs. Starch wagged a bony finger. Now that's personal. Way too personal. Nick began. Nick again heard an ornery cry like a bird trapped in a pillowcase. What is that? He said to Mrs. Starch. She glanced worriedly behind her. In the undoubtable shade, an anvil-shaped scar on the chin was so dark that it was almost purple. I didn't hear anything, Marta said. Mrs. Starch bent down until she was nose to nose with Nick and up close her nose was not especially attractive. It wasn't smudged with mud or freckled with what appeared to be tiny insect bites. I'm going to show you something extraordinary, she said, but if either of you tell a living soul and you blab a single word of this, then I swear I'll flunk us, said Nick. Kill us, said Marta. Worse, exclaimed Mrs. Starch. I'll lose all respect for you. All respect. Nick blinked. It was news to him that Mrs. Starch had any respect whatsoever for them, and judging by Marta's baffled reaction, it was news to her as well. Nobody else besides the two of you must know, the teacher said forcefully. Not your mummy or your daddy, not your Gabby little pals on Facebook, not your third cousin in Goose Falls, Arkansas. Nobody. Is that clear? Clear as a bell, Marta murmured. Mrs. Starch grabbed Nick's left shoulder. This is life or death, she whispered. Can you understand that? Well, we won't tell anyone, said Nick. Life or death, Miss Starch repeated, and then she dropped on all fours and scurried into the tent. As suspected, the local newspaper and TV stations identified Dwayne Screw Jr. as an unnamed juvenile with previous arrest for arson. But even if the authorities had released the boy's full name, the impact of Dr. Dresser's steady, well-organized existence would have been no more than shattering. Truman's students sought for arson, flees cops. That was just one of the unpleasant headlines that prompted the school's board of trustees to call an emergency meeting on Saturday. The board members were highly distressed and asked many questions of Dr. Dressler, who answered as best as he could. Some of the remarks were quite unfair in the headmaster's opinion, yet he didn't waste enough energy trying to define, defend himself. 
The mood in the room was tense, which he could understand. It was disgraceful enough that Truman's student had been charged with a serious crime. But sensational media accounts of Dwayne Jr.'s escape and mad dash across campus, leaving the sheriff detective panting in defeat, had pitched the board of trustees into a fever. Although technically it wasn't his job to arrest a handcuff arsonist, Dr. Dresser expected to be punished, possibly fired for allowing the detective to be confronted by the boy while the boy was in classes or in session. In the end, the board voided, a voted to reprimand the headmaster and ordered him to expel Dwayne Screw Jr. from school effective immediately. When Dr. Dresser pointed out that Dwayne Jr.'s grandmother donated a large sum of money to Truman every year, the board members quickly huddled for another vote. This time they decided the boy should be suspended temporarily until the criminal case went to court, at which point his status at Truman School would be reviewed. Dr. Dressler faced two undesirable chores. One was to notify Melissa Winship, Dwayne Jr.'s wealthy grandma, and the other was to notify Dwayne Screwed Sr., kooky father. The headmaster flipped a coin and now he was driving to the Screwed residence. Turning down the road, he noticed a sheriff deputy sitting in a squad car parked on one corner, and another one he could probably see in a black sedan with tinted windows was on the other end. They were waiting to grab Dwayne Jr. if he tried to sneak home, although Dr. Dressler thought he'd have a better chance if they concealed themselves. The headmaster pulled in next to the graffiti-sprayed Tahoe belonging to Dwayne's father. As before, concert music was coming from the windows. Beethoven this time, not Bach. Reluctantly, Dr. Dressler got out of the car and trudged to the steps and rapped on the door screen door. The stereo cut off and the raspy voice yelled, Come in! Make it quick! Mr. Scrooge! Cautiously, the headmaster stepped inside. Dwayne Scrooge Sr. was reclining in a lounger in front of the TV set. The picture was on, but the volume was turned down. Dwayne Sr.'s cap was practically proper, propped crookedly on his head and his faded shirt was unbuttoned to the waist. Perched on the third bare arm of the chair was the enormous blue and gold macaw. I remember you, Dwayne Scrooge Sr. said groggily to Dr. Dressler. So does Nadine. May I sit down? Nope. State your business and be on your way. I already had too many visitors today. Dwayne Sr. didn't take his eyes off the television screen. The bird, too, seemed entranced. What are you watching, Dr. Dressler asked. A cooking show from France. That wouldn't have been the headmaster's first guess. Based on Dwayne Sr.'s rough appearance, Dr. Dresser would have expected to find him watching pro wrestling or maybe a demolition derby on a Saturday morning. But you can't judge a book by its cover, Dr. Dresser reminded himself. After all, the man did listen to classical music. Dwayne Sr. took a slug of Mountain Dew and said, Junior's mom lives in Paris. We're thinking she might turn up on this TV show. And when they get there, when they get to the part of the recipe where they put in the cheese, she has the shop, that's all. She sells fancy cheese, you imagine? Dr. Dresser didn't know what to say. He reached in his coat and took out two packets of onion crackers from the school cafeteria. I brought these for Nadine. In the flash, the bird swooped across the room, snatched a treat from his hand, and flew back to the chair. What do you say to the man, Nadine? Thanks a million, the bird squit walked. Dash you, doos. Dr. Dresser pressed onwards. I came to talk to you about Dwayne Jr., he said. After everything that's happened, I'm afraid we have to suspend him from school. Dwayne Scrooge Sr. finally turned and stared at him directly at the headmaster. I sure don't want to be the one to tell his granny. No, sir, that's my job. Did you see the news? Yeah, at least they left his name out of it. The situation is very serious, Dr. Dresser said. Dwayne Sr. agreed. It's a shame, too. Past few days, DJ's been hitting the books pretty hard. Then all that nonsense had to break loose. He brushed a piece of cracker off his sleeve and said, Nadine, you eat like a pig. He had the bird return their attention to the French cooking program. Dr. Dressler stood there feel, feel, feeling out of place and unsure what to do next. As headmaster of Truman School, he had a duty, duty in such troubled moments to say something wise and helpful to parents, but never before had he dealt with a character like Dwayne Screwed Sr. Can I say one more thing, Dr. Dressler asked? All right, but only because you brought crackers. The best thing your son can do is turn himself into the police as soon as possible. Dwayne Screenier, Sr. scratched his cap. You might be right, but what if you're not? What happened to Junior then? Mr. Screwed, they'll catch up with him as eventually. And when they do, they're going to come down twice as hard. If you see Dwayne, please tell him. Heck, you can tell him yourself. Hey, Junior, 
Dwayne Scrooge Sr. sat in front and raised his eyebrow. DJ, come on out here. Dr. Dressler heard a door creak, following the footsteps in the hallway. Dwayne Scrooge Jr. appeared looking calm but serious. He wore camouflage hunting style clothing and carried his motorcycle helmet under one arm. The headmaster, who had never been in the presence of a fugitive, was more nervous than Dwayne Jr. What are you doing here? He asked the boy. Uh, my laundry, Dwayne Jr. replied. But the police are staked out at both ends of the street. Oh, I came in the back way, the boy exclaimed, through the neighbor's yard. They're at the rodeo in Zoflo Springs. Dwayne Sr. spoke up. Junior, the man says you're suspended from school. Duh. He also says you should give yourself up. Yeah, right, said Dwayne Jr. The bird squawked, rose from the chair, and buzzed Dr. Dressler in search of more crackers. The headmaster ducked to no avail. The macaw landed squarely on his neck and began poking at him through his hair. Nadine, barked Dwayne Scrooge Sr. Help me, Dr. Dressler whimpered. Dwayne Jr. grabbed the bird and launched it out the front door. His father sighed and sat back to watch the cooking program. Dr. Dressler gingerly propped the collar of her shirt to make sure Nadine hadn't left a nasty little present. That bird's a royal pain, Dwayne Jr. muttered, wiping his hands on his trousers. Am I bleeding, Dr. Dressler said? Just a scratch. Watch it out real good when you get home. The headmaster weighed his next words very carefully. Dwayne, you can't keep running forever. Oh, I don't plan to. If you had a lawyer, he'd advise you to surrender to the police immediately. And I'll tell him the same thing I'm telling you, Dwayne Jr. said. I can't prove I'm innocent if I'm in jail. Dwayne, just listen. No, you listen. I didn't set that fire, and I'm not taking the fall for it. Dwayne Jr. looked angry, and it didn't seem like an act. Over the years, the headmaster had heard many lame lies and invented stories from the students who had gotten in trouble. But he was a hard, and he regarded himself a hard man to fool. Now it looked into Wayne Screw Jr.'s eyes. It occurred to Dr. Dressler that the boy might be telling the truth. If you aren't the arsonist, who is? No idea, Junior, Dwayne Jr. said. How'd your book bag end up there in the swamp? Dwayne Jr. glanced over his father and lowered his voice. Pop said a tax man came here and stole it, but who knows? Some days he's all over the map. They heard a loud thump and turned to say Nadine hanging on the giant moth of the screen door. Like a moth on the door. Dwayne Sr. looked up from the TV and shook his fist. Don't you dare let her back in till she says she's sorry in all three languages, too. Dwayne Jr. paid no attention. To Dr. Dressler, he said, now I got a question for you. Certainly, the headmaster was eager to offer some sensible guidance, but he was not, but that was not what the young man wanted. Be straight up with me, he said. After you leave this house, are you going to run and tell those cops I'm here? Dr. Dressler hesitated, yet for a moment he startled and said, no, Dwayne, I won't breathe a word. That's a promise. Thanks, dude, and the boy called smoke disappeared down the hall. Mrs. Starch came out of the tent, cradling her straw hat with a crown face down. The hat seemed to be crying. Hush now, said Mrs. Starch. Then very quietly to Marta said, there's a cooler full of milk bottles under the tarp. Will you go get me one? Mrs. Starch sat cross-legged at the base of the cypress tree with the hat in her lap. She warmed the bottle in her hands, uncapped it, and attached a rubber nipple. Nick and Martin knelt in front of her. Peeking inside the hat, they saw a squirming ball of honey-colored fur. It was kitten. It was a kitten unlike any kitten they had ever seen before. We call him Squirt, Mrs. Starch said, because he pees all day long. The little cat lunged for the bottle and began to suck noisily. When Marta reached to pet it, Mrs. Starch stopped her. Rule number one, no cuddling, she said. He's so awesome, Marta whispered, Mrs. Starch would allow. What is it? I bet Nick knows. He said it's a baby panther a small living and breathing version of a stuffed one he had seen at Mrs. Starch's house. The teacher smiled. That's correct, a Florida panther. Correct again. Somebody actually read the class syllabus, Mrs. Starch said. The other acceptable answer would be Felis Cornes Cordin, which puma is also poetic. In parts of South Africa, the word means mighty magic animal. To Nick, the kitten was a thing of unreal beauty, exotic yet delicate. Its pelt was dabbled with spots that would fade over time, and its long, tawny tail bent upwards at the end, but was ringed, almost like a leopard's. Oversized and pointy, the ears were wooly and as white as cotton on the inside. The panther's muzzle was framed by bands of coal-black fur, now dribbled with milk, and they gave the appearance of the outlaw-style mustache. Its eyes, barely open, were a creamy shade of blue. Soon they would turn brown and eventually pale gold. Nick remembered from his reading the front paws, already larger than a tomcat's, were clasped around the rim of the nursing bottle. And what a powerful motor for such a pint-sized critter, more rumble than purr. 
Where's the mama, Marta wanted to know. Not so loud, dear, Mrs. Starch said. Is the mother cat dead, Nick asked. There were so few panthers left out in the wild that it was hardly anybody ever light eyes on one. No, the mother's alive, Mrs. Starch said. At least that's what Mr. Spree believes. He fancies himself the expert. The kitten abruptly spit out the nipple and emitted a lion-sized burp. Mrs. Starch laughed, an uncommon sight. To Nick and Marta, she said, you two have a lot of questions and I'll get to all of them in due time, but right now it's time for little Sir Squirt me to, to finish his lunch, don't you? As if on cue, the cat meowed for more formula. Mrs. Starch gently lifted the bottle from the kitten's mouth and began humming a lullaby. The tune was surprisingly soothing and pretty. Marta and Nick were stunned. So as a side of their teacher they had never observed or even had imagined to be part of the Buzz Saul personality. So for a while, they sat peacefully in the swamp, listening to Mrs. Starch hum while the little panther slurped happily in the emerald leaves overhead, shimmied and shook in the sunlight. The cool breeze felt good. Nick reached for Marta's hand. End of chapter 19.